a nonprofit social enterprise that I started when I was a student here at MIT um, in the technology and policy program. Uh, my co-founder, Vanessa, was a master's of engineering student and then later came back to Sloan, also like right when we were starting Saha. So we had a ton of support from MIT in our first few years, um, which I'll talk a little bit in our founding story. So I always love coming back um, and speaking here, because we definitely would not be where we are today if it wasn't for um, the support of our partners here at MIT. So Saha, as I mentioned, is a nonprofit, but what we do is partner with women who live in rural communities right now in the northern region of Ghana, and we teach them how to start for-profit businesses. So all of the revenue that these women make, they completely manage. It doesn't come back to Saha, and it stays within their community. Um, but they are for profit. So basically, um, these businesses provide either clean water or electricity to their community. Saha will donate all the capital equipment that the women need to get started, but after opening day, we don't provide any financial support to the women entrepreneurs. Now, the way that we're able to reach more communities more quickly and have the capital that we need um, for all of our training and that donation is through a program that we call our Global Leadership Program, where we bring young people from around the world who are interested in development and looking to get kind of experience in the field, and then we train them how to train the women. And it's been a really interesting model um, for us to use for our own kind of growth and expansion, and when we started that program, it was really transformative for Saha, so I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. Um, so I always like to share kind of a little bit of, of Saha's founding story whenever I explain what our organization does, because so many of the reasons why we ended up using the Global Leadership Program as our source for kind of revenue and growth was because of kind of frustrations that Vanessa and I felt as students who were really interested in development and really interested in doing something um, and felt like no one really wanted our help or our skills. Um, so I first started getting interested in international development when I was an engineering student at UVA and I randomly went on one of those alternative spring break trips and we went to Nicaragua and volunteered at an orphanage for a week. And that was the first time that I had ever left the United States, so it was very eye-opening for me just to see how other people around the world were living with so much less than what I had. Um, and I was a little frustrated by, at the end of the week as an engineer, feeling like there was so much more that I could have done than just kind of play around with kids in this orphanage for a week. I really wanted to do more. At the same time, that frustration then I realized could really be empowering because I was only 19 years old, I was, it was my second year in college, and I could clearly see that I had skills that I could contribute that could really have an impact on people's lives. And I didn't really see that with aerospace engineering necessarily. I really loved like differential equations and physics and everything I was studying, but I was like, if I got an aerospace job tomorrow, I wouldn't know anything, like I wouldn't be able to do anything confidently um, at some big engineering firm. But right now I feel like I know what I need to know to be able to do something um, to, that would really make a difference in Nicaragua. So that was really empowering for me and I joined our chapter of Engineers Without Borders and I spent the rest of my time at UVA traveling and working on all different sorts of development projects all over the world. Um, and it was really awesome and it definitely became my passion. Uh, but then I graduated and I got a job with a defense contractor in DC and I thought that I could still do what I had done at school which was like pursue my academic studies or in this case my career and then in my free time work on development projects. And I learned very quickly that that was not the case and that you use like, your free time to see your friends and you use your vacation time to go home and visit your family for holidays. Um, and so I realized after about two months that that job wasn't for me and I really, really wanted to pursue a career in development. Um, and then I started looking for jobs and it was really frustrating. I felt like no one would even talk to me because I didn't have my master's of public health or seven years of experience working in the field, even though I had felt like I had done a lot as an undergrad. 
So eventually that frustration is what led me to look into graduate school and the reason why I applied to the technology and policy program. Now, when I was here at MIT, my advisor was doing work in the northern region of Ghana. So she's the first person that brought me to where Saha now works today. Um, and she was studying a certain type of water filter. Um, but really the reason why we were in the northern region was because the water crisis was particularly dire in this area. And the more and more that I started thinking about what I really wanted my focus and development to be, um, the more I, re I started becoming really passionate about water. Um, and that was for a couple of reasons. The first was I found it to be kind of crazy that I would read statistics like almost a billion people lack access to safe drinking water and millions of children are dying every year from waterborne disease. But then when you look at kind of what people were doing in the area, you can see that there's so many solutions to this problem that already exist. There's tons of really cheap water filters um, that you can use to treat very contaminated water in rural areas. There's biosand filters, there's UV disinfection, chlorine, there's so many different things you can do, and yet people were still dying every day um, from this preventable disease. And that gap between kind of the engineers and scientists who were really focused on developing appropriate technology and the end users, um, who either weren't using these technologies correctly or didn't even realize what was available to them, that gap is what really interested me. That's why a program like TPP was really intriguing to me because it focused on so much more than just engineering. It focused on policy and implementation and the long-term effects of technology on society. So when I first came to Northern Ghana, um, I saw this issue that, that I had been really interested in with regards to the global water crisis was really kind of on display here. So in the north, um, it's very difficult to drill boreholes or wells. Um, you can't access the groundwater because of the bedrock. And when you do, um, in the very few cases that you can hit water, the aquifer recharge rates are really low. So people will drill wells and then they'll dry up within a year. And then there goes $10,000 of usually aid money um, that's basically gone to waste. At the same time, almost every rural community has access to a water source. It's just fecally contaminated because there's no access to sanitation. So it's not like some other areas of the world where you hear people have to walk like six hours to get to the closest river. Almost every community that's not on the pipeline that doesn't have municipal water has like a little man-made pond within like a half mile from the center. Um, at the same time, if you walk around the markets where every single person from these rural communities goes to sell their crops, you can find chlorine, you can find ceramic water filters for sale, you can find water treatment products, and yet no one in the communities was really using them. Um, and so all this stuff that I kind of was becoming really passionate about was, was happening in the northern region, and that's where we eventually came up with this idea for the Saha Global Water Businesses, which I'll talk a little bit about. So the way that the water businesses work um, is they're very simple. There's no moving parts, there's no pumps, there's literally nothing that can break. What we really do is just train women who live in these rural communities how to use products that they can find right in the market they then treat water in a centralized location and then they sell the clean water to members of their community at an affordable price. So the first thing that they'll do is collect water from the local source. That is a picture taken in one of our partner communities called Chani. Um, and that's a very typical water source. They're called dugouts. So they're man-made ponds that fill with rainwater in the rainy season and then just sit there stagnant throughout the dry season. Um, none of our partner communities have access to sanitation and people practice open defecation. So the dugouts become contaminated with both human and animal waste. Now my advisor was working in the northern region because she was really interested in water filters and the turbidity of the water um, can be a major factor for how well certain water filters work. And the water in Ghana is the most turbid, but basically the most muddy water that she had seen in her 25 years of working around the world with different water sources. So basically the water is extremely muddy and extremely contaminated. 
So the women will collect the water from the source and fill, and by hand, fill these three 200, 200 liter drums, which we set up right next to the water source. Then they'll use a product called alum, which is a flocculant. So you add it to the water and all the particles will flock together and sink to the bottom of the blue drum. So that basically removes the turbidity, but then the water is still contaminated. The ladies will let the water settle overnight, and then the next morning they'll scoop it, again by hand, from the blue drums into that larger tank called the poly tank. Um, usually we'll size them at around 1,000 liters to 1,400 liters based on the size of the community. And then they'll treat it with chlorine to disinfect the water. Now the alum and the chlorine are both products that are available in the local markets in Ghana. That's why we chose them. Um, and we don't really, we're not really tied to this model for water treatment. As we grow and go to new areas that have different technologies available, you can really kind of fill in any particle removal plus disinfection step to treat drinking water. What's really kind of unique about Zaha is our business model. So once the water is safe to drink, the ladies then sell it to their community. They use the revenue that they make from the sale of the water to buy more alum and more chlorine and to pay themselves for their time. Now we'll also donate one of these blue buckets to every family in the community. Um, and basically it's a bucket with a tap and a lid. We call it a safe storage container. And that helps to prevent the water from getting recontaminated in people's homes which is really important because they are still walking to fetch water, they're bringing it back to their house, they're storing it in their house for two to three days um, in a community where people don't have the best hygiene practices. Again, they don't have access to sanitation. So just by having a lid and a tap so you're not dunking your hand in the water goes a really long way um, for preventing recontamination. So you guys help fund to get them started to buy initially that huge drum mm -hmm. and Yep, so we'll donate all of this, all the equipment that you can see in these pictures. Now the reason we decided to donate the equipment instead of doing some sort of micro lending program, um, which we started Zaha in 2008 where all anyone at MIT and everywhere wanted to talk about was microfinance. Um, but we really did believe that everyone has the right to access clean water. And we thought that a for-profit business model would be a great way to keep the center up and running because it would give the women the resources they needed to pay themselves for their time and fix things if it broke, but we wanted them to keep the price low enough that everyone in the community could afford it. And the way that we were really able, the only way we were really able to do that was by donating the equipment. At the same time, we found that there are tons of people here in the US that love to donate equipment. Like they want to know that their one dollar bought two blue buckets. They don't want to know that their one dollar is paying for a Ghanaian staff member to go back and check on the community. So the materials was the easiest thing for us to fundraise for, so it also made a lot of sense to keep that as a donation instead of a lending model. Do you control the price in some way? We don't control it. The communities all decide how much they want to they want to charge for the water. We'll say that, you know, typically we found that women charge in between five and ten pesos, which is like between three and seven cents here, uh, three and six cents in the U.S. Um, but the ladies pick the price. They pick their pricing model. So some women do like someone pays a flat, flat free fee for the month, and they can fill how much, however many times they want. Some women just do pay per purchase for every bucket that you come. You have to charge pay a certain amount. Some women, instead of walking to fetch the water, they set up their water treatment center in the center of town and pay little boys with donkeys to go fetch the water. So they charge a lot more in their communities because they have to pay the donkey boys. So there's a lot of different funding models and we let the entrepreneurs you know, decide whatever they How want. Are you choosing? How do you choose the women? So the women are nominated by the community, um, by the village chief and elders. And that's something that when we first started Saha, um, we had like very different ideas for how that was going to happen. We thought we'd have like women's focus groups and meetings and see who's the most excited and the most entrepreneurial and we learned very quickly that that was not how things worked uh, in this culture and women were very uncomfortable like raising their hand and even volunteering for this position and that they wanted the village elders to make the decision. Um, so that's what they've been doing. 
So about two years ago, we also started expanding to provide solar electricity in our communities. And this really came out of kind of the needs that our partners were telling us. Um, a lot of our, our partner communities would say, you know, water is life, we're so excited, we have access to clean water, we see benefits in our health, but for our community, the next step really is access to electricity. Um, and the more that we looked into it, the more we realized really how much having access to electricity affects so many different aspects of someone's life in a rural community. Most of our villages, the people are using kerosene lamps for light at night um, when they're not on the grid which are extremely harmful for your health and bad for the environment. They release black carbon, and it's really expensive. People were spending up to 40% of their yearly income on kerosene, which, so clearly it was a big priority for families to have light at night, and then the kerosene's making them sick, and it's bad for the environment. Um, so we decided to experiment and see if we could, could apply our same model from our water businesses to solar, and so far, uh, it's worked out really well. So what happens is, again, we'll donate all the capital equipment um, that they need to set up one solar charging station. So that, for our businesses, is two 100-watt solar panels. And then this yellow box is called a gen set, but it's just like a branded word for a battery, an inverter, and a charge controller. Um, so then we'll also donate a bunch of rechargeable AA batteries, and the women will, own, they own the batteries, and then they rent them out to members of their community for a fee, and when the charge runs out, people return them and pay for another recharged up pair. Now we'll also donate one lantern to every family in the community, the same way we donate those blue buckets. Um, and this is a way for us to get at the, one of the main issues we were trying to solve, which was the use of those kerosene lamps, while also building in some demand for the batteries, because every lantern uses three AA batteries. Now, people can also come and charge any other small electronics that they have. The most popular items are cell phones and radios. Um, and I always love to show picture number five, because this was taken on the day after opening day in our partner community, SAC Palua. So these are all phones that people already owned in that community. They were just traveling three hours to Tamale, which is the capital city, and paying to charge their phone there. Um, so now people can just walk out their door and pay to charge their phone in their own community. It saves them tons of time and money, and their money is staying within <coughs> the village. It's supporting women who live in their community. It's supporting that community economy. Um, and from our initial calculations from the families that we've been talking to, um, they've told us that they're saving the equivalent of about 116 US dollars every year by not paying for kerosene and renting batteries instead, which when you're living on you know, less than $2 a day, that is a huge, huge um, thing for your family. And that's money that families have told us they're using to send their kids to school, they're using to invest in their farm, um, to buy more land to make their um, family some more money. So Saha implemented our first business in June of 2008. It was funded by the Public Service Center here at MIT and the Legatum Center. Um, since then, we've opened 77 more water businesses and 15 solar electricity businesses that provide jobs for 191 women in Ghana. And really the statistic that we're the most proud of is that every single business that we've opened is still in operation today. And that sustainability rate is really unheard of when you look at small, community-run development projects. We see for ourselves in our partner communities just like failed project, broken solar panels on the outside of someone's house, or big, huge, complicated water tanks that have fallen into disrepair. So this is something that we're really proud of and we think set Saha apart from a lot of other organizations working in this space. And we really think there's two main reasons why we've been able to be so successful. The first is that these are businesses. So the women are motivated to keep them open, they're being paid for their time, and they have the resources that they need to fix things when they break, which they do. Like our water business is four big buckets with no pipes or pumps, and there's still things that break over the long run. This little tap will break, different things rust, and so you need to be able to have the resources to fix things. 
I would say our women entrepreneurs are definitely like very altruistically motivated at first. Um, a lot of them feel kind of awkward about making sure that everyone pays, um, and it's something we really, really drive home during our training because these women are really busy. Um, most of them have huge families that they're in charge of managing. They're farmers. They collect shea nuts in Ghana to make shea butter. Um, they have to cook three meals a day over an open flame, which takes forever. Um, so we know from our now years of experience that the very first time the shea harvest comes or the first time that they're ready to go harvest cassava, the women are going to choose those activities over running the business because that's what's bringing in money for their family. And so really during training we spend a lot of time on making sure that you're charging the right price, making sure that you're paying yourself and not just saving everything to go back into the business. The second reason why we think we've been so successful has been our commitment to monitoring and evaluation. So we won't go into a new community unless we have enough funding to go back and check up on that business for the next five years. Now we won't provide any financial support. Um, we're basically there as just like a troubleshooting team. So for the first six months, we'll go back and check up on the business once a week. And we do household surveys and just meet with the entrepreneurs. And the first week of every month, we do water quality testing at the water businesses. Um, and we have a team of five full-time Ghanaian staff members that each visit three communities a day. And they just talk to people. They ask people about the taste of the water, about the hours of the center, if they're convenient for their day. Um, they talk to the women about how sales are going, if they're not going well, if they have any ideas why. And there's tons and tons and tons of little things that happen every single day um, that could end up being a huge problem for the business if they're not addressed. And that's what our team is really there, is to help the women address them. Uh, and just like any small business owner, they have a ton of questions, especially in the first year. Um, and then later on down the road, sometimes they'll forget things. Like if nothing breaks until two years after opening day, they might forget that they can just go buy a new tap in town or they just need a wrench to tighten it. So having our team there for that long-term training has been really crucial. After the first six months, if things are going well, we'll drop down our visits to three times a month for the rest of the year to twice a month. Um, but we're going at least once a month to check up on the communities for the next five years. Um, in our solar businesses, it's been awesome because once they have access to electricity, the very first thing that the women entrepreneurs buy are phones if they don't have them already. Um, so then they call us when there's problems, which saves us a ton of time and money uh, during monitoring. So that's been really awesome as well. So the way that we've, as I mentioned before, really been able to grow has been through our global leadership program, which we launched in 2010. Before launching this program, we were like any other small nonprofit. We would fundraise, and raise as much money as we could here, go to Ghana, implement a new business. We had one part-time Ghanaian staff member who was doing our monitoring a couple days a week. Um, and then we'd run out of money and come back and fundraise all over again. And it was really hard, but we felt like we had a really good idea. It was working in the communities that we were partnered with, and we really wanted to be able to grow and reach more communities. At the same time, we started getting emails from students who had found our website and would say, I just want to get field experience. Can I come volunteer over J term? Can I come over the summer? Is there a way I could leverage this into some of my thesis research? And we would just say no all the time because we were like, we don't know what we're doing. Like, we're not even real yet. We don't like a volunteer would be really hard to manage. Um, and then one day, Vanessa, my co-founder, and I were like, you know what? This is exactly what used to frustrate us when we were applying for jobs and trying to get into international development. Like, we felt like we just want to go do something about all these issues that we're learning about in school, and no one would let us come help them. And there was nothing that we were doing that was that complicated. We were like, we started this when we were 24, we could easily teach an 18-year-old freshman how to implement one of these water or solar businesses. It's not rocket scientists. Um, so we thought of this idea for the Global Leadership Program, and it's really been transformative for our organization. So basically how it works is we bring whole groups of students with us to Ghana um, every winter and every summer. Um, it's usually about 75% undergraduate students and then 25% master's students and recent grads. Um, and then we pair people in multidisciplinary teams of four and partner them with a community that we've selected based on their needs and their size. 
um, but we've never worked in before, so they don't have access to water or electricity. And then we'll train our, the groups, the field reps, how to train the women. So basically it starts with a four day orientation um, where we spend a ton of time in the classroom is what we call it, and then a ton of time going out to our current sites so they can see businesses up and running. But then after that orientation, the teams are basically on their own. They're paired with a translator and they have a, a manual. Um, and they go out to their community every day and work implementing a business and then come back and stay at a guest house every night where we'll do a daily debrief and check in with them. But one thing that I think our, our field reps really like about this experience is how much autonomy and how independent they get to be. Um, they're really in charge of the complete project implementation from start to finish. And there's tons of things that are different about every community. So while we give like a basic implementation guideline um, there really are decisions and like really important things that our teams are deciding in the field during implementation now every one of our field reps is required to pay two thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars to participate in the program and that covers all of their food and lodging but also all the materials that we donate to the community and the five-year monitoring cost of that community to saha global so basically all of our Ghana operations and programming uh, right now, all of that is completely covered by revenue from our global leadership program every year. And then when Saha wants to grow or wants to try new programs, for instance, when we launched the solar program, we sought outside funding and got a corporate sponsor, which funded all of our piloting of that program until we felt, felt comfortable bringing in field reps and doing a solar global leadership program, which is like our long-term financial support for our operations. So many of our field reps choose to fundraise to cover their program fees since we are a 501c3 nonprofit. It's very similar to fundraising like you were going to run the Boston Marathon. Um, some of them do pay it out of pocket, but this is something that I think we really offer to our field reps as well as experience learning how to fundraise for development. I know for myself um, and Vanessa, it was a huge wake-up call. When we were here at MIT, we won like every grant we applied for. We felt like we were like the superstars of development at MIT. And then as soon as we graduated, we didn't have any access to that funding anymore. And we lost every grant we applied to. Sometimes we made it to the finals, but we never won. Um, and so learning how to get cash and talk to people and get them to want to support something that you really believe in is a huge, huge skill. And we like having our field reps go through that before they do the fun stuff. Because it's very easy to fall in love with this work um, without realizing how hard it can be um, to work in this field. So one thing that's really been fun for me to see um, after launching this program, we've now had 297 field reps participate in the Global Leadership Program. And now so many of them have graduated and are doing amazing things, whether they joined the Peace Corps, or they started their own social enterprise, or they're working for the World Bank, um, or maybe they're going into like corporate America, but they're still donating to nonprofits with some of the money that they're making. And that's how we really see Saha having an impact way outside of Ghana and way outside of solar and water is hopefully inspiring young people to get involved in issues that really matter and trying to get really smart, passionate people focused on development and maybe not on like developing a dating app or something. We want people to realize that they can use their skills and it's worthwhile to pursue a career kind of in social enterprise and in international development. Well, this is my typical recruiting slide that I'll skip over. Um, so now this is the full Saha team. We've come a long way since the days of just Vanessa and I um, as students in 2008. All of our other full-time American staff members, Catherine and Sam, were both field reps. Uh, and we actually just sent out an offer today for another team member. Um, so every time we hire, we hire exclusively from our network of field rep alumni. Um, it's a huge network of people that we've gotten to know really well, so that program is a great vetting process for us. Um, on our board of directors, we also have a seat, which Mark Mormons is holding right now, that is filled by a field rep alumni and changes over every year. Uh, in addition to a 10-person board of advisors, that's all alums. 
um, that really contribute to our long-term growth strategy. Um, and then really the, the core of our team is our Ghanaian staff, Shaq, Peter, Amin, Eric, and Wahab, and they're in charge of all of our monitoring and evaluation. They're going out to communities every single day. Uh, we used to have a full-time American staff member who lived in Ghana managing the team, um, and last year Shaq got promoted. Um, so he's in charge now, and we're really excited that all of our Ghana operations are managed by uh, Ghanaians. So that is the Saha story. I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have for me about anything. And first, congratulations. I oh, think it's a great and I'm glad you pursued it. Uh, I want to ask you, how much does it represent the profit for these women working solar and water? So the water women are usually making in between a dollar and two dollars a week for about five hours worth of work. So it's definitely not a full-time job. They go open the business every morning, sell water for like an hour, come back um, at home. The solar entrepreneurs are making a lot more money for seemingly a lot less work because they just start plugging in phones. Um, so they're making more like $10 a week. Um, they also have save a lot more of that money because the equipment is much more expensive if it breaks. Um, so right now, what we usually see is the women will save up in between like $150 and $200, and then once they hit that amount, we'll help them open a bank account so they can know like there's money in there. If something breaks, I have it because they get very, very nervous about that. Um, and now we're really trying to encourage more spending um, of their profits because we don't just want them sitting on it forever because they're nervous. So this year was really exciting. We had a couple women who said that they they each took 100 Ghana seeds, like $50, um, and used it to buy more seeds for their farms. Um, and then we have two women that separately came up with this idea where they're buying cell phone credit because um, it's pay as you go on your phone. And now they're selling that at their business as well while people come to charge their phone. Um, so they're using their profits to buy those credits, which then is growing their business as well. Um, so that's been really fun to see. But do you know the percentage it represents for their total income? Oh yeah. So most families are living on like less than two dollars a day. So that's three hundred and six, like in between three hundred and sixty-five and seven hundred dollars a year. Um, and then they're they can make up to like five hundred dollars a year from the solar business. So it's a huge jump in their income. <coughs> Fascinating. Um, I had a question about water and you know, the laws of Ghana, or the you know if there's any governmental challenges involved as you work. It sounded like with informal power relationships and tribal entities. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't run into any roadblocks. We do now have an official relationship with the Ghanaian government, um, although like the the hierarchy of chiefs is also recognized by the government as like an official governmental body. Um, so we've always worked through all the village chiefs um, and we basically view our first meeting as a pitch to them and see if they want to work with us. About two years after we started Saha, we started reaching out to the local district assemblies who are like the governing body in the northern region. Um, and so now we basically just go and meet with them once a month and say, here's what's happening in our communities in your district. Do you have any recommendations for us and places where to work? And they'll give us like a list of communities that don't have municipal water, that they're not going to expand the grid to, and then we'll go check them out and see if they'd be good partners. And then if we decide that anyone might be a good partner, we like write a little letter that says, like, Saha is requesting that we work here. Um, but there's no like, funding support from them, there's no oversight for them. Um, as long as we just like go and check the boxes, then they're happy to partner with us. Um, I think we're doing really good work, but it does seem kind of scary for organizations that maybe aren't doing good work or taking advantage of communities that there's like zero oversight from the government as far as development projects happening in the like very rural remote areas where we work. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you're asking these these governing bodies if uh, they're planning on providing municipal facilities to these communities. Have you um, come across the issue at any point of you know thinking about setting setting up a business in a community, um, you know, only to have it you know later be attached to a municipal supply, which would I mean, 
be great for the community, but yeah. not necessarily for the business. I mean, our goal would be that we eventually get put out of business completely. Um, mm -hmm. I think that having reliable access to electricity and water provided by the government or a big governing body is like the goal. Like people are still walking to go fetch water from our water business. They're still dependent on two women entrepreneurs that if they're sick one day and the business isn't open, it's not open that day. Um, we've had five water communities where they've opened public stand pipes there. Um, the pipes don't run all the time, so they're usually open like one or two days a week. So the women now are using that water and storing it in the poly tank so that people can have access kind of throughout the whole week. So their businesses have stayed open, their revenue's definitely gone down, um, but they're still there for like any time that the government water is not running, which is really what Saha's focus is, has always been on is reliable access and so that people never have to worry where their next bucket of clean water is going to come from. Um, in one of our communities, they did expand the grid, um, so they now have access to electricity, and the women actually had used all the money that they had saved and went and bought a grinding mill and hooked up the grinding mill to the solar panels and now have a like grinding business um, or milling business in the center of town. And they did that totally on their own. It was so exciting. Um, they asked us, um, they asked Jack, who monitors in their village, um, they're like, is it okay if we use our money to go buy a grinding mill? And he's like, it's your money, sure. Like, go ahead, a great idea. And then he randomly told me, like, not at one of our weekly check-ins, like, sent, texted me a picture of the mill. And I was like, why didn't you tell me this was happening? This is the coolest story. I'm so excited. Um, so that happened. Now we try and be really careful about selecting communities that we know aren't going to get access anytime soon because it's you know kind of a waste of resources and time from our end. Um, but sometimes it happens. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I just had a quick question. I was wondering if you would comment. You know, um, the people selling the water and electricity on the ground are women, but all of your Canadian team members are male. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's a total fluke, but a lot of people do notice it. Um, so, for as far as selecting women to work with, when we started working in water, it just made a lot of sense to partner with women because they are in charge of managing all the water in the household in Ghana. Um, and once the men found out that the women, you're going to have to like collect water by hand and treat it by hand, none of them want anything to do with the water business. They're like, oh, that's the women's job. We can't carry like a thousand liters of water in one day. Um, so then we expanded to solar. I was really interested in seeing how communities re react. By then, we, I, like empowering women became a core part of our mission. What started as something that was like, oh, we really care about bringing clean water. This is going to be nice to provide jobs to women in an area where they're already experts. Quickly turned into really loving working with women and providing opportunities for them when there's so few in this area. Um, so we knew we wanted to stay working with women in solar, but we're prepared that if, like, culturally, it was, if it was just going to be too hard and we would not be able to open solar businesses run by women, that we'd be open to working with men. And so far, I guess we've established enough of a, rela of a reputation for being a women's organization that we've gotten zero pushback about that. We just tell the community, like, oh, you have to nominate two women to run the solar business, just like the water business. And they're like, okay. And usually they pick the same women to run both of them. Um, as far as our team goes, it happened very organically. So um, Peter and Shaq were our first two employees who I met through my advisor at MIT. Um, they were actually translators for me for my thesis research, and so naturally I just came to hire them. Um, and then when we went to go hire new people, the staff made recommendations and we hired the best people for the job. We have a ton of part-time women translators who work with us when we have field reps um, in Ghana. Um, we have a lot of part-time male translators as well, so I would love when we need to hire again that we can fill that position with a woman. Um, but again, we always look at, out of all of our candidates for a certain job, who's the best applicant, and right now it's ended up being these four guys. They're all hired at very different times. Yep. I've got two questions. One is, um, what's your relationship with uh, all the organizations doing similar things? Institutions to do field 
relationships with other organizations. We have like pretty amicable relationships with most other organizations. My advisor at MIT actually runs a nonprofit who sells ceramic water filters to people in this region, so you, she could be considered a direct competitor for what we're doing. Um, but we've always kind of managed to have a very amicable relationship and realizing that household water treatment and these ceramic water filters are a great fit for some communities and community-centered um, water treatment are a better fit for others and so we kind of manage that by when we do our scouting and like post we have a whole Google map where we put like communities that might be a good fit that won't be and anytime we have ones that aren't a good fit I send them to Pure Home Water and say these might be a great place for filter sales. Um, Shaq actually used to work for her at Pure Home Water um, and she had to let him go and so we swooped him right up and that ended up happening like without any bad blood. There are some other organizations that, I don't know, work in a very interesting way. I've had organizations from the US come to Ghana, request a meeting with me and say, here's 200 communities that we're gonna work in in the next 15 years. We'd love for you not to work there now. And then we've never seen them again. So there's definitely that weird, it's like a very strange, like competitive dynamic, but for the most part, we've had like really good partners. We've been partners with UNICEF for a really long time, formally in some cases, and now more informally. Um, but they're the ones that facilitated all of our relationships with the government. Um, so that's been really awesome as well. Um, what was your other question? Um, Recruiting from Ghanaian University. Oh yeah, that's something I would love to do. Um, we've had a lot of Ghanaians who are American students participate in the program, but uh, probably like five, not a ton. Um, so that's always really cool. I think the biggest hurdle to overcome is that one of the main reasons why we have the Global Leadership Program is the financial and the human resources and the program fee of 2950 can be inhibiting for a lot of Ghanaian students, um, but also not for others. So I'd really love there to eventually be in the position to start like a scholarship fund as well, which we wanted to do for schools for American students as well, because there's tons of people that really want to do this work that maybe don't have the same network to be able to fundraise from um, as other students do. Um, so that's always been like a funding goal of mine as an executive director when I'm reaching out and applying to grants and trying to find new funders. One of our newest ideas is to try and get our alumni to all give in like a class fund the way you do for like your college or university and use that to fund future field reps. And now that they're getting older, like some of our early classes, that might be a reality. Because with 297, if everyone gave 10 bucks a year, like, it's great. There you go. You send someone. Yeah. Uh, um, question, not about the business model, but if you have had the opportunity to show health benefits within a community that has had your entrepreneurs for several years. So we anecdotally have a ton of stories. Um, as far as actual numbers, we focus all of our monitoring on access. So is every business open? How many days a year is it open? How many people at any given time have clean water in their home when they're randomly visited? Um, and that's because collecting baseline data is really expensive. Um, and every study I basically see about health impacts of Rural development projects are just like ripped apart by people about not being done the right way because diarrheal disease, it has to be reported, not observed. And so it takes a really long time of establishing a relationship with the community before that can happen. So we've basically been like, we know and prove in every single one of our villages that the water is fecally contaminated and that's what people are drinking. And our water from our water businesses is safe to drink by WHO standards and we know that drinking fecally contaminated water can make you sick and drinking clean water is good. So having access to the clean water. Um, but we've, I've always told universities, like we'd be totally open to partnerships if there are students who can gather the baseline data, do our intervention, and study it afterwards. Um, I've been talking a lot with UVA, actually, the Center for Global Health, about that, because um, they're looking at doing a scholarship for a UVA student to do our program every year but they would have to have a research component as well, so maybe one day you can get that. It sounds like a five year one to two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Well, kind of following
comment on that. Do you have a sense of, um, I don't know, I guess the market penetration in these villages? How many of the families are opting to buy clean water versus going with um, free water that might be contaminated? Yeah, so it's about 75% uh, on average. At any given time that people, like the way we measure it is, is there clean water in your safe storage container in your home, like at the time of a visit? Um, and every time one of our staff goes to a community, they visit a minimum of six households. The data is not perfect because if they go and no one has clean water, then they'll go and visit like 20 households and try and figure out why and all of that data gets entered in. Um, and usually for monitoring in the longer term, they're targeting poorly performing communities because they need to have more face time with them. Um, but in general, that's what we find. Um, I post our, all of our monitoring reports online once a month. Um, so we have all that data for each month. You can go online on our website, click on sustainability, um, and see our little chart of usage each, each month, how much money the solar businesses are making each month, and then just anecdotal like success and failure stories from the month. Yes, hi. Seeing you out of the corner of my eye. Uh, question about the <clears throat> expansion possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, both you're taking this village utility from water and adding charging uh, is there a third thing in the wings uh, and then second is the geographic spread when you have to start uh, territory and you're expanding there mm -hmm. do you see going further afield is there demand or now those conditions in, in you know, countries in the neighborhood or in other areas mm -hmm. those have always been our two kind of expansion talks when we talk about our long-term strategy is different services and then different locations so we're really happy with the water electricity combo. Um, one thing that we've always talked about in Saha is that we always want to be solving like bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like real needs in communities. Um, and we've seen such a positive impact of like the one, two water electricity punch that now we're really focused on geographic expansion. Um, so two years ago, we expanded to a different city in Ghana. So we have two kind of headquarters in the northern region. Um, and now we actually just decided we're going to expand to Nicaragua this year. So the position we just offered today is for a Nicaraguan like country director. Um, it's a field rep alum who's going to go live there and help scout. Like we have a good sense of what area we want to be in and did an initial trip, but go like map villages and start looking at different options in the market and. The need for geographic expansion we had always thought about, but it really came out of the Ebola crisis last year. So we like basically couldn't pay someone to come work with us in Ghana last winter, in the middle of the Ebola crisis. Even though there was no Ebola in Ghana, we had lists and lists of communities that needed clean water and electricity, um, and students wouldn't come or their parents wouldn't let them. Um, we typically take between like 40 and 60 students, and we had 15 last winter. Um, so it really hurt us, and that revenue also supports our long-term monitoring in Ghana. Um, so that all of a sudden geographic expansion really got pushed to the forefront of our priorities. Um, and we knew that we'd want to be outside of the continent of Africa because of the way that people think about it being one big country here in the US, unfortunately. Um, so we were really intrigued by like Central or South America, even though we read proposals um, for Asia, like all over the world, and then we eventually focused on Nicaragua, which we're really excited about. Um, but like Senegal is like was a major runner up, and we're like we could do exactly what we're doing in Senegal. We have an area that we could work in, but it's too close to Ghana for us right now. If there was ever a, like a political issue or another health outbreak, we didn't run into the same problem uh, with those two locations. So that was an eye-opening experience for me. Something I did not think would affect us as much as it did. Cool. Well, will you join me in thanking Kate? Thank you.